Good morning to all of our participants. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Virginia Yu and I'm a communication officer at IRENA. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on Understanding the COP21 Contributions in Light of Renewable Energy in Latin America, Mexico and Costa Rica. For those of you not familiar with IRENA, we are an intergovernmental organization that supports countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future. We promote the widespread adoption and sustainable use of all forms of renewable energy, including bioenergy, geothermal, hydropower, ocean, solar, and wind energy, in the pursuit of sustainable development, energy security, and a stable climate. IRENA serves as a network hub, an advisory resource, and an authoritative, unified, global voice for renewable energy. IRENA has 143 members and 30 states in the process of becoming members. I'd like to now introduce Ruben Contreras Lisberguera, IRENA Regional Program Officer of Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, Virginia, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try to summarize briefly what IRENA is doing in, in the Latin American region. Uh, first, we have the REMAP, which is a, an activity that we're uh, implementing in Mexico uh, and basically try to describe the potential renewable energy resources and how by 2030 Mexico could generate up to 46% of its electricity each year or 280 terawatt hours uh, from renewable energy, energy sources. Uh, in addition, you can see that uh, we have been working in partnership with PTV, which is the German Metrology Institute, uh, OLADE, the Latin American Energy Organization, and the Electricity Institute of Costa Rica in June, uh, working to support the development and implementation of regional quality assurance frameworks for solar water heaters. Uh, in 2013, in March, uh, IRENA launched the geothermal initiative uh, activity in the Andes. Actually, it's an Andean geothermal project in partnership with the Andean Geothermal Center of Excellence, uh, the Geothermal Institute of uh, New Zealand, Oakland University, OLADE, and the International Geothermal Association, EGA. So with those partners, we have uh, held workshops in Iceland, Peru, and Chile to support governmental officers, uh, regulators, and technical staff aiming to support the development of geothermal projects in the end countries. Actually, uh, a week ago, uh, the last one was in Colombia. Um, <clears throat> additionally, we have, uh, during the fifth assembly, a high-level meeting with the participation of uh, representatives of 12 countries, in the, re in the region, uh, it took place uh, um, that activity and participants issued a joint communique that identifies priority areas for collaboration with IRENA to facilitate the deployment of renewable energy in the region. Also, uh, we have been working in a draft strategy document uh, which is going to be presented to the stakeholders in Central America for the Clean Energy Corridor for Central America. Uh, this is a regional activity and uh, will try to uh, accelerate the development of renewable energy te technology and use the potential and uh, at the cross-border trade of renewable power in the region. Um, and basically, to f I would like to summarize that we here at IRENA are doing a lot of research uh, publications to inform um, the development of the of the use of these uh, renewable energy sources in different Latin America, in the Latin American countries, uh, by trying to addressing the climate change and reducing, you know, the CO2 uh, CO2 emissions on greenhouse gases. Um, I would like to finalize talking a little bit about the COP21. Uh, for the for the first time at any COP, there will be a powerful spotlight on renewable energy as a key climate solution. And this is going to take place to, through a series of events taking place from December 4 to 7. And uh, this is including uh, many workshops. And uh, actually, 
a particular day, which is going to be a high uh, level event uh, held by Irina, which is called the Energy Day, basically. So thank you for, for the opportunity to share with everyone this information. Thank you, Ruben, for your remarks. We would like to share a quick note that IRENA is hosting this webinar in support of our stakeholders, but does not endorse or recommend specific products or services shared within its webinar series. Information in this webinar is featured in the IRENA Renewable Energy Learning Partnership database as just one of many best practice case studies. For today's webinar, we have two options for listening in. You may connect by computer by selecting mic and speakers, or by phone by selecting the telephone option in the right-hand panel. If you should face any technical difficulties during this webinar, please contact the GoToWebinar help desk at the number provided on your screen. I would like to encourage everyone to participate in today's session by asking questions. To do so, simply select the questions panel in the right-hand bar and enter your question with a note of who you would like the question directed to. We will be collecting questions throughout the webinar. If you would like to watch this webinar again or share it with a friend, we will have a full recording available on the IRENA YouTube channel as well as the IRELP website. If we are not able to answer all of the questions during today's session and you wish to connect with our panelists, I encourage you to visit IRENA community at irena.org slash community and join the discussion under featured topics. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. Our first speaker will be Dora Lopez, PhD. Dora is the founder and chief editor of Latino America Renovable, she brings 12 years of experience in the renewable energy sector. Her experience includes international technology transfer, technological entrepreneurship, energy and cost life cycle assessments, and research analysis and journalism of complex energy topics. Second, we will hear from Dr. Monica Araya, founder and executive director at Nivella followed by Dr. Deborah Lay and Dr. Silvia Palma Rojas, who are both scientific board members at Latino America Renovable. Dr. Lopez will provide more information about the panelists' biographies. I hope you all enjoy the webinar. And with that, I would like to hand the floor to our first speaker and moderator, Dr. Dora Lopez. Dora, you have the floor. Thank you, Tini, for that introduction, and thanks to Irina for hosting the webinar today. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you around the globe tuning into this webinar. It is my great honor to serve as moderator. Today, we will have three speakers, and we'll have time for questions after all the presentation, like Jeannie just mentioned. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Monica Araya. She has worked on development, environmental issues, and politics for over 20 years. She collaborates regularly with leaders in civil society, government, and business with a focus on climate action and advocacy. She is the founding director of Costa Rica Limpia, a citizen platform that promotes clean energy development and democracy. She founded Nivella in early 2014. Monica, good morning. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my presentation. I will be uh, introducing the topic of INDCs. Um, this webinar will have the, the special attribute of combining INDCs and renewables. So what I'll do in the next minutes is to walk you through what INDCs are um, I am going to, I'm having some problems moving the, moving the presentation, so let me see how I can fix this, one second. Uh, don't worry about it, 
we can see the presentation. So, yeah, it's just that when I try to move it, okay, great. Um, so basically, in a few minutes, I will go up through three things. The first one is what is an one what is an INDC. Second. And where are we on the road to Paris? Monica, uh, on, oh, very good. Oh. Monica, I think you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's get started with um, the first question. What is an INDC? I'm having some problems moving the presentation. I'm very sorry. Um, this, is not this is not happening. Um, it's not working, sorry. So when I try to move the slides... You can, uh, you can try the enter button. That's yeah, what I, we had to do. Actually. I'm sorry. Yeah, and normally it works, but it's not working this time. So. Um, let's just let's just get started like this. As we know, um, these contributions were created in the context of the UN climate negotiations, and basically, governments have agreed to to sign a new climate agreement that will enter into force in 2020, and it will be signed by December. One of the strong attributes of this agreement is that each government will define its own contribution. And basically, that contribution will cover the period of 2020 and 2030. So, the concept of an intended nationally determined contribution was born in that negotiations, and countries are invited to make that contribution also on adaptation. So, um, the concept here is that countries will say how much they will reduce emissions, but they will also say um, if they want to how much they will do to adapt to climate impacts. And this, this particular dimension has been very important to developing countries, even though we won't mention it here. I just wanted to make sure that people are not left with the impression that it's that a nationally determined country contribution is, um, is only about reducing emissions. It says intended, the I, means that countries will uh, put this offer on the table, but they will, uh, in, they will adjust it. Ideally, they will improve it. And um, what we have seen is that, um, what we have seen is that there are principles in the conversation that help us frame how these INDCs uh, will, will, um, will be incorporated. Every time you see this moving, is because there is something wrong when I move the, the the slides. So I am very sorry, but we don't have a solution for this right now. So I'm going to have to switch to a different system. If you bear with me, because I know this is becoming a bit annoying, but bear with me. Um, basically, the information that goes into the INDC was decided a year ago. Uh, they have to submit some information about um, the, some baseline information so that we provide uh, other countries with with um, data that is ideally complete in that allows us to comp compare uh, one INDC to the next. Uh, the format of those INDCs um, has been suggested in, in, in two conference of the parties. Uh, we have two important deadlines this year. Uh, by the end of the first quarter this year, 
countries that were in a position to do so submitted their INDCs. I will let you know which one they were. And basically, before the 1st of October, which is this week, uh, countries will have to, to make their, their submissions. Um, the focal point of each country, the, the focal point to the UNFCCC is, is the person who sends this submission. And there is a portal online, and basically that is where, where you um, will have government submitting and you will have the public understanding what the submissions are because these documents are public. What happens after the, the country makes a submission? Well, basically, they are all listed publicly. Anybody can, can download them. Uh, most of them are in English. Some of them are in several languages. And basically, and this is important, the UNFCCC will have a synthesis report by the 1st of, October, of November, which is a month from now. And they will inform, <coughs> I beg your pardon, they will inform about the aggregate effect of these INDCs that have been presented to 1st of October. Some countries have already said they will present it afterwards. So let's just review very quickly the types of INDC that countries can prepare. And again, the reason why countries can have several ways of framing their INDCs is because the system tries to be flexible so that we increase the number of INDCs submitted around the world. The first model tries to get the INDC to be framed around an absolute reduction with respect to a base year. Um, personally, I think this is the best way of making a contribution because it's very straightforward. You set a year, for example, 2005, and then you say that by 2030, which is the reference year for this uh, first generation of INDCs, you say compared to 2005, for example, we will have a reduction of X percent. So it's quite straightforward. Some countries have used it. For example, uh, in the case of the US, uh, this is a summary that was tweeted. Uh, and it is very easy to, to capture. Basically, you say, well, by 2025, there will be a reduction of 26 to 28 percent levels um, of emissions compared to, to a, um, a, a year. X and it, in this country the year was uh, 2005. The, this this um, this model is usually ref referred to as baseline year target. So that is one option, and unfortunately not everybody is taking it. So what, what happens is that in practice you have other models, and that somehow creates a problem when you compare uh, the INDCs. But here I wanted to to capture an example from the from a Canadian newspaper. Um, they basically try to make the case that they, that this um, that these um, INDCs were using the same format, but they inform of the different levels. And um, other countries basically use a reduction with respect to a business as usual trajectory. What that means is that you, if you look at the graph, um, if you look at the yellow line, and you look at the gray line, basically what you are communicating to the international community is that in 2030 your emissions will be lower, not necessarily uh, in terms of absolute emissions, but, but basically they will be lower with respect to that projected business as usual trajectory. That, that means you are saying we will do something because if we don't do it, our business as usual emissions will be much higher and basically um, that is how you frame it. The, the, the downside of this is that you may be reducing your emissions compared to a business as usual trajectory, but in practice your emissions might be growing. And then of course there are some uh, discussions around how you calculate your business with respect to projected business as usual scenarios in 2025. So they will have a 50% reduction uh, with respect to that BAU, as, as is known. And Colombia also used that framing, you know, 20% with respect to projected business as usual scenario by 2030. There is a third option for countries that chose to do so. Um, basically, there is our intensity targets. And normally, they are framed uh, in terms of GDP. and what the 
uh, the INDCC is that they will reduce the carbon intensity of the gross domestic product or GDP and then they choose a year. Uh, you could also, uh, this is a variation, it could also be mentioned as a separate uh, way of framing the INDC but for, for the sake of, of keeping this short we just included in this under this model and basically so another way of framing this is through a reduction of per capita emissions. Um, this is a, a visual example of the draft and I want to emphasize this is a draft INDC, this is not Chile's INDC but I think the, the visual is, is quite clear um, and, and is an example of this relative reduction with respect to one unit of, UN, of GDP. So what they, the draft proposed was to say, is, okay by 2030 we have two options with respect to our carbon intensity of GDP. We, we suggest to reduce it between 40 and 45 percent by um, 2030 or we propose to do it uh, between 35 and 40 percent um, by 2030. They also propose an intermediate, an intermediate uh, target in 2025. But the point here is to give you a flavor of how countries are, um, are discussing this at home and in the case of, of Chile they haven't yet um, proposed the final number but my point was to illustrate that that countries are, are having the choice of, of making their own contributions. And then finally the fourth model might be very attractive for smaller countries, islands and countries that don't have a lot of emissions and basically this fourth model uh, gives the choice of framing the INDC around a package of public policy. So for example you could have, um, you could have a policy package that allows countries to reduce fossil fuel consumption, you could have a package that increases the, the production of renewable energy and basically you could specify the reductions uh, associated to this package of policy. So, so uh, I'll stop very soon but just uh, two slides. Um, I wanted to, to confirm that as of today uh, 83 parties have submitted their INDCs. Uh, it says 27th of September but I actually updated the number this morning um, but it's 83, the latest one was Brazil. Um, and at least 90 INDCs are, are expected to be submitted between now and the 1st of October including Costa Rica which is covered in, in this webinar and is, is my home country. Um, in the presentation I won't go through each of these but basically I wanted to, to commend the 10 countries that submitted their INDCs in the first round and, and, and as you can see Mexico was the first uh, developing country that did this, um, that, that submitted this INDC. So we were very excited by that in Latin America. Um, clearly we're not going to discuss the effect aggregate, uh, the aggregate effect of the INDCs but I wanted to capture that there are very serious efforts to, to measure how much these INDCs add up to and we will see our around four, four um, assessments in the next months. The, the formal one will come from the, the UNFCCC but there will be the UNEPCAP report. I participate in that report and the steering committee so there will be a very very interesting report coming up in the next weeks. There will be others independent efforts and I think it's very important to engage on what these INDCs mean. Uh, and, and the final thoughts that I wanted to leave you with is that The INDCs, when a country announces an, an INDC for 2030, it doesn't mean that that's it, you know. It means that they have a number but these, these INDCs will be part of a cycle of continuous improvements. Um, the story, the INDC story doesn't end in Paris, it starts in Paris. Second, the INDCs numbers don't tell the whole story. Some countries are doing a lot of things and they don't want to capture everything in those numbers. So the good news is that there are so many things in so many sectors getting engaged uh, with renewables, smart cities, efficient buildings, smart agriculture and not everything is captured. So even though we need to understand the INDC's numbers, in practice we know that the story is bigger than that, um, that, that um, tool or that framing. And finally I wanted to end up um, by saying that the INDCs are an opportunity to accelerate and deepen climate and energy policy design that is going on already. They help us integrate 
uh, climate climate act, climate change into development, and they have created a quality of engagement um, by other sectors that are normally not discussing climate change. And this this kind of engagement that we have seen this year is it would have been unthinkable a few years back. So so I do want to leave you with that thought that that we could think about as an imperfect but very good opportunity. Uh, uh, an imperfect tool, but a very good opportunity on the table. Thank you. Monica, thank you for that presentation, and thanks for sharing with us this brilliant overview of the INDCs. We know you have to work through some very technical difficulties right now, and you presented that overview and the models. We learned a lot from your presentation. Great presentation. We are going to move on now um, to our next speaker. She's joining us from Guatemala today. It's Dr. Deborah Lay. She is a renewable energy expert with the Central America Regional Green Energy Initiative. She holds a PhD in environmental change from the Environmental Change Institute of the University of Oxford. She holds a Master of Science in Civil Engineering with a focus on energy systems from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical and Mechanical Engineering. She has worked over 15 years in the field of renewable energy, rural electrification, sustainable development, and climate change and have published diverse peer-reviewed articles on the same topic. Deborah, thanks for joining us. Good morning to everybody. Well, actually, good morning here in, in Guatemala, and thank you to Dora and our Irina and Ivela colleagues, and thank you for all, to all of you for joining us this, this morning. So I'm going to give a case study of Mexico's INDC and what um, the role of renewable energy is towards meeting those um, towards meeting the, the contributions offered there offered therein. So I want to briefly explain um, what the climate change and energy policies have been as it helps shape what the IN, what Mexico's INDC look like. Mexico has been very proactive with the UNFCCC and in the whole realm of, of climate change. Mexico is the only country so far that has published five national communication um, with their respective greenhouse gas inventories. To date, they also have three national strategies on, on climate change. And in 2009, they developed the first special program on, on climate change. In 2012, there was a unanimous approval of the general law on, on climate change. Um, there have been, as um, Monica stated, for the INDCs of them being dynamic, the same thing has happened in Mexico with the, with the different strategies. And also, um, as Monica had, has also stated, Mexico was the first emerging economy to submit their, their INDC. And uh, Mexico has also hosted um, COP16 in Cancun years ago. So Mexico has been very proactive within this field. In terms of energy policy, I am just listing here some of the main guiding documents um, and policies that, that are currently governing what the energy sector, how the energy sector is working with, and especially with regards to to renewable energy. Uh, one that I would like to highlight is the law for the use of renewable energy and financing of energetic transition, which calls for a reduction of fossil fuels to 50% by, by 2050. And currently, there are several um, sectoral programs and strategies that are taking place that are also promote the use of renewable energy and the National Program for the Sustainable Use of Energy, all of those which are currently in progress and several of those which will be updated after 2018. Here we can, in this, in this table, we can see what is the possible, probable, and, and proven resources for geothermal, mini hydro, wind, solar, and, and biomass. So we can see here um, the great potential that it is. This came out of um, Mexico's current national energy energy strategy. 
And in this table, you can see what are the different what were the different goals of renewable energy capacity and what the different results were. So this is to show that in in some um, resources such as biomass and and, and biogas. Um, and mini hydroelectric, the, the total generation goal was was met, and in others not so much, but there is a close um, degree of completion, such as for for geothermal. Uh, from the perspective of renewable energy up to 2016, we have this projection of renewable energy use of distributed generation, self supply, and and public service. And we can see here what the distribution is between, um, well, this graph mainly shows the hydroelectric contributions, mainly hydroelectric and, and wind. And in this graph, we can better see what the different bio, bio energy and, and solar photovoltaic projections are to 2026. So to get back into the topic of the INDCs, Mexico has stated that they will um, that they are committed to reduce unconditionally 25% of his, of their greenhouse gases and short-lived climate pollutant emissions below a business as usual line for, um, for the year 20, 2030. And there is an implication of a reduction of 22% of greenhouse gases and a reduction of 51% of of black carbon. Um, the black carbon reduction is, is a commitment coherent to the mandate established in the climate change, change law prioritizing cost-effective mitigation actions with, with social benefits. This commitment is also um, stating that there will be a net emissions peak starting from 2026, afterwards decoupling greenhouse gas emissions from economic growth. Additionally, Mexico is stating a conditional reduction of 40% subject to global agreements and is subject to um, different topics including international carbon price, carbon border adjustments, technical cooperation, access to low-cost financial resources, and, and, technical, and technological transfer. The different sectors included in, in this INDC include the energy sector, and I'll come back to this in a, in a moment, industrial processes and product use, agriculture, waste, land use, land use change, and forestry. In terms of, of energy, um, it is divided in two main categories of fuel combustion and fugitive emissions from, from fuels. And for the renewable energy analysis, which is the main purpose of this webinar, we're focusing on the energy industries and, and transport, also on the, well, it is important to, to mention that transport and energy generation are two big sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions that are being tackled throughout this, this INDC. Something um, very new and very positive of this INDC is the whole um, annex on, on adaptation. And there is a section that highlights the adaptation of strategic infrastructure and productive systems, which states um, energy infrastructure vulnerable to adverse effects of climate change. And it recognizes the importance of incorporating climate change criteria into the design, construction, and lifetime operation of projects to increase their, their resilience. The focus of um, strategic infrastructure and productive systems for the energy sector is focused on the security of dams and hydraulic infrastructure. Um, and and as, I, as I said a moment ago, this is very positive as usually renewable energy and climate change adaptation tend not to be mentioned together. Climate Action Tracker has been doing an analysis of all the INDCs submitted, trying to make an analysis and get all the reductions under a same 
um, baseline, so to speak. Um, this goes back to Monica's reference to the four different types of, of INDC. And, and what they have done is try to analyze, is analyze um, considering all the pledges, both conditional and unconditional, what the different reductions have, um, will take us, and have they been inadequate, sufficient, or a role model based on, on national circumstances. So in the case of Mexico here, um, we can see in the solid black line what are the historical emissions. In the dotted black line, um, the reference level for the for the INDCs, and the red one is the unconditional unconditional target. And we can see that that Mexico is making a, a sufficient um, pledge based on their national contributions. Um, but here we can see also what the different timelines are, um, 20, 20, 2025, 20, 2030, and going all the way up to up to 2050, um, and which we hope that the black dotted line would continue to, to reduce. So in terms of an analyzing um, the role of renewable energy, there are several things that are highlighted here. Um, to start with, um, and because of the of the agreement to produce these these INDCs, as explained by by Monica, this is the first time Mexico assumes an unconditional international commitment. Something that they are highlighting that that was highlighted during their their submission. Also, that there are different renewable energy. Well, the energy sector targets are supported by renewable energy actions that are reflected in the National Program on Climate Change, the Climate Change Strategy, and their different renewable energy programs and policies. That is, that the different climate change and energy policies currently in place will enable the country to meet those specific goals. Um, furthermore, there are indicative targets for renewable energy development by technology of 22.81% by 2018 and 24.61% by, by 2024. And of course, these um, statistics will be updated in the in, in newer energy um, policies and strategies in the, in the perspective of renewable, of renewable energy. Nuclear energy and natural gas are considered um, towards meeting the INDC contributions. And something else that I would like to highlight here is the gender perspective. Within the adaptation annex, and actually throughout the, the document, um, the I, Mexico's INDC talks about increasing resilience, especially to the, to the poor communities that have a high um, vulnerability level. And when they talk about rural electrification and local community resilience and the linkage to the sustainable development goals, which are actually currently being discussed this weekend in, in, in New York at the General Assembly, gender takes an important role. You know, what, are, what is the role of, of women in terms of, of energy use and in making communities of well, their own families and communities more secure? So the gender perspective being added to the to the INDC is also very positive in that hopefully it, it will be implemented and also help to um, to meet the other the other goals. Uh, we can think of, of this view of gender as a uh, not only as as a as a contribution but also as a as a co benefit um, that is and, and a necessity to meet the goals. Another thing that is highlighted here is the role of adaptation for productive systems, um, for productive systems and vulnerable infrastructure. As I mentioned ago, the focus here is on is on dams and on hydroelectric projects. And one thing here is that although dams and hydroelectric projects would be the most vulnerable to the impacts of, of climate change, other renewable energy resources are also are also vulnerable and need to be considered. <coughs> Vulnerability is not something that is limited to, to a specific um, technology or 
or renewable energy or renewable energy resource. So we need to think of the vulnerability of the resource itself and also of the excuse me of the infrastructure that that will be that will be used. Poorly planned or designed renewable energy infrastructure, um, this is um, with whichever technology, can increase vulnerability, especially in, in rural areas. So the view of, um, a vulner of adaptation and renewable energy um, is a first step, and we need to think both on projections on what our resources will look like to ensure that we will be reducing the emissions that we need to reduce and also to ensure that the infrastructure is robust enough to withstand adverse impacts, but also that that infrastructure would not increase population's vulnerability. Finally, we need to take a more integrated alternative um, discussing renewable energy infrastructure reforestation and watershed management that the INDC starts to, to address, and which again is very positive in terms that it doesn't silo each of the different categories. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks for that presentation and give us a perspective on Mexico definitely becoming a role model for the region. I would like now to move on to our third panelist. She's joining us from California, Dr. Sylvia Palma. She has over 14 years of experience in multidisciplinary and multicultural environments with extensive knowledge of economic modeling, energy and climate change policies, sustainable development and life cycle sustainability assessment. Currently, she serves as a specialist at the Californian Energy Commission. She holds a PhD in economics and a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Brasilia. Sylvia. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Dora, for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. Well, in this presentation, we are going to discuss the policy framework and context that help to define the national contribution that Costa Rica is going to present in the COP21 in December. And it is important also to remember what we want to bring into the discussion is renewable energy is the goals of this contribution of climate plan. So this presentation is focused especially in the goals in the energy generation and transportation sector. Um, and the main targets proposed by Costa Rica, what I said before, from December in December in Paris. And then I wanted to give a small example about uh, renewable energy in the process of Costa Rica to meet the goal of the national contribution. It's just a small example about the capacity production. Well, like I said before, well, to, to understand how Costa Rica defined his contribution goal, we need to go back in 1990s with the publication of the energy law, also known as the law of autonomous or parallel generation of electricity that helped to bring new projects in the country, new energy projects in, in, in the country. In 2007, was presented the National Plan of Development 2006-2010, where among other strategies, one is promoted is the use of biofuels and other renewable energy sources in the country. And some of the challenges were rather re reduce the dependency of import of fossil fuels, take advantage of the renewable sources in the country, generate 100% of, of the electricity from renewable sources by 2021. Also, in 2007, Costa Rica announced the voluntary commitment to become the first carbon neutral country by 2021. How many of you know Costa Rica always has been very proactive in this topic? In 2008, it was presented the National Energy Plan 2008-2021, the focus on enabling the biofuel market, diversifying the energy mix by introducing renewable energy targets in reducing dependency of fossil fuels. Again, Costa Rica always focused on reducing fossil fuels. Also, in 2008, the country presented the National Program of Biofuels. In 2009, published the biofuel regulation that fostered the development 
of the fuel industry in Costa Rica that is still in progress. Also, in 2009, the country published the National Strategy of Climate Change that aimed to cover the country into the carbon neutral economy by 2001. In 2012, it was the officialized the national the carbon neutral country program. In 2014, it was published the national plan of development 2015-2018. That among other things, called for the strength and diversification of the energy mix. It called for the research, development, and evaluation of projects related to alternative energies. Also, that year was published the third national communication with base year 2012. And finally, in September, like a, the, yeah, like a two weeks ago, Costa Rica published the National Plan of Energy 2015-2030 that aims to first promote the energy efficiency, distributed generation sustainability of the electricity energy mix, e update policies, improve the social environmental normative. Also in this National Energy Plan, Costa Rica they want to promote a clean public transportation system with alternative fuels, it review the import regulations, it requirement for new in use cars to promote energy efficiency, it reduce the emission of pollution. And another strategy of this energy plan was to promote an integral strategy planning through policies and action that ensure quality and contribute to the sustainable development. The national energy policy is focused on the sustainable energy system with a low carbon performance. In last year, in the last week, was presented a draft of the plan of the proposal of the, in, in the, uh, of the, the climate plan for the COP21. Well, uh, according to the direction of climate change, the Office of Climate Change of, of, of Costa Rica, the, prepara the preparation process starting in January 2015. First of all, with the identification of mitigation sequestration options. Second, with the definition of mitigation actions, with technical analysis of the main driver for the emission of the every sector. The sector they take into consideration was transport, energy, agriculture, livestock, industry, and forest. And well, after that, the, the, the the political validation phase and the publication of the draft of the INDC. Well, uh, and last Tuesday or Wednesday, now I don't remember the, the exact day, uh, Costa Rica, like I said before, presented the proposal they, they are going to take in Paris, to, to, to Paris. Well, one of them, like I said before, we are focusing on the energy and transportation sector. So one of the proposal that Costa Rica is going to take is the install energy capacity 100% renewable, efficient and low carbon public transportation system is solid waste management that promote recycle in composting. Why they put this last one, the solid waste management, because have a lot of potential when have a lot of potential with the production of biogas and biomethane that help to to attain the other two proposal goals. Well, Costa Rica identified that attain carbon neutrality in be a low carbon economy need to transform his transportation sectors. Uh, well, and we can see that those proposals uh, of the INDC come in conformity with the National Plan of Energy 2015-2030 that I just mentioned be be before, that the priorities for the transportation sectors are the environmental friendly fleet, sustainability public transportation, and cleaner fuels. Well, now uh, we can see the goals Costa Rica in the INDC take, give numbers, put goals to achieve for 2020-2030. It have as a base year 2012. Well, the first goal, well, uh, the mission to have in 2012 is 2.4 million tons of CO2 equivalents. And for 2021, the, the goal is to decrease 12% of the emissions. For 2030, is to decrease the emission in 25%. And Costa Rica goes beyond the 2030 with, with a target for 2050 
they decreased uh, 52% of the emission of two, uh, 2012. Also give numbers for emissions, um, GHG emission per capita. So the goal for 2030 is have a, a intensity of 1.7 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions uh, per capita. Well, uh, now we understand uh, what Costa Rica is going to present in December. It is important to understand or to have the state of the art of the sectors, the energy sector, the energy power sector, and the transportation sector. We can see here that, that uh, in 2014, these uh, graphs on, on the bottom, is um, how is the electric the electricity and energy mix for 2014. We can see the Costa Rica, like uh, we know, have, is very clean, very renewables. We can see the 90% of the Costa Rica electricity come from re re renewables. In 2014, have a participation of 10% of thermal or the fossil fuel. In 2015 was a great year for Costa Rica. Uh, we can see that um, the participation until now, until uh, August, that this graph was made until August, uh, have a participation of 1% of electricity for fossil fuels. Uh, so we can see, well, this is the main um, energy as we see here, uh, hydropower, geothermal, e wind are the main uh, renewable energies in, in Costa Rica. Uh, well, like, like, well, as many of you already know, Costa Rica has been have 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 different records associated with generation electric electricity from only renewable re resources. For example, the first record was uh, ten consecutive days generating only with renewables in the last days of 2014. The second one was was in the media, I think many of you know that, uh, was uh, 75 consecutive days from January 1st to March 17th. And the third one was 94 consecutive days from May 8th to August 9th. He also from March uh, 18 to August 22, the country has 23 no consecutive days of generating only with renewables. So we can see that the goal of installed energy capacity, 100% renewable, is going in the right well, uh, way or direction. Well, if we observe the national GHG inventory, we can define that the energy sector is the main contributor of GHG em emissions in Costa Rica. And inside the sector, we can identify that the transportation sector is responsible for 60% of the emissions. So Costa Rica identified that to get to carbon neutrality, the transportation sector plays a key role for the country. To get to the to attain the goals, we need to work on the transportation sectors sector. So to have an efficient and low carbon public transportation system, a transportation sector need to come into discussion. So this is just a, a picture that we can see a freeway in Costa Rica that is you know, kind of freeway, <laughs> it's more a slow way. And in the, in the picture below, we can see in the bottle, we can see uh, streets inside some of the city. So also have a strong, um, is a big problem, the, the traffic in those areas. Well, if we see uh, the, this graph, that the personal vehicles contribute more, more 5%. So we can see really to have an efficient and low carbon um, transportation system, really Costa Rica need to work in the private vehicle in public transportation sectors or, or strategies. Okay, from my perspective, uh, the challenges in the transportation sector, Costa Rica need to see different points. One of them, well, like they propose in the 
in the climate plan is the efficient public transportation system, a legal, legal support, support for the production of alternative fuels, infrastructure for the transportation in storage of the alternative fuels, cleaner fuels like a bioethanol or biodiesel, renewable natural gas, like a biomethane, hydrogen fuel, electricity for renewable sources and new fleet. Well, like I said before, here I am. I did a small exercise to see, well, Costa Rica need, need an uh, efficient and low carbon transportation system. Let's see how the country is, is, is his capacity to really to go into this goal. So I did a little exercise with the bioethanol production capacity in, in Costa Rica. So I have some assumptions about this exercise. The, the base year was 2013. We proposed no using ethanol as a biofuels, just using like a E10. Uh, the sugar cane production was 4 million tons. The gasoline consumption, 1 billion liters. And we have an industrial uh, productivity. If the ethanol is made from molasses, it will, will be 12 liters for sugar cane ton. It will be for just for juice, can juice will be 25 liters for sugar ton. So we we play here for different scenarios. The first one will be if Costa Rica produced his ethanol from 100% of molasses, or if produced by ethanol from 100 from cane juice. That would be crazy because need to produce sugar. But well, and the other one will be 43% from uh, for cane juice also, or a mix, we have a mixed structure like a Brazil, they will produce bioethanol uh, with molasses or cane juice also. With the results of this uh, uh, simple exercise, we can see that if Costa Rica use all, he, all the, uh, its molasses production to produce by, 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 by bioethanol, they have a negative balance. So maybe the other uh, structure will be better for, for the use a uh, can juice or, or a combined uh, raw material for ethanol production. Well, the main conclusion of this, um, the, the, this, of this presentation with this draft of the uh, commitments of Costa Rica for December and this um, panorama of the production capacity of biofuels alternative uh, field we can see that Costa Rica had defined its national contribution according to the reality and capacity at the INDC R4 or R about. Uh, the country reaffirmed the goal of moving its economy towards carbon neutrality by 2021 and decarbonizing the economy by 2050. Thus, Costa Rica will have a formal commitment to achieve carbon neutrality, it contributes with the collective ambition to limit global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial levels. Also, Costa Rica will make the commitment of having an efficient and low carbon public transportation system. Today, this sector is the main contributor, as we mentioned before, of GAG emissions, which is inefficient It depends on almost 100% of fossil fuels. Thus, the transportation sector play an important role of achieve the goal of 1.7 ton CO2 equivalent per capita by 2030. This national contribution goal calls for a low carbon transportation system if renewable energies are key in this process. And Costa Rica will make the commitment of having 100% of renewable electricity generation capacity and as we see before, uh, as we saw before, Costa Rica is working in the right direction to meet this goal. Well, this is all I have for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia, for that thorough presentation on Costa Rica. I would like to finish um, with some remarks regarding our initiative at Latino America Renovable. Um, with our bioenergy initiative, 
why now? We heard during this uh, webinar about how renewable transportation is so important for really achieving the goals that we need to meet to reduce carbon emissions. Renewable transportation has been lagging behind, even in energy plans. When you look at renewable energy plans for the different nations in Latin America, you would see, well, transportation was not really included or was left at the end. And now we're seeing a change of tone, new goals, new targets for Mexico. We heard from Debbie 50% renewable in transportation by 2050. We heard from Sylvia, 66% of the transportation is, is, is causing the largest emissions there. So um, this is a sector by energy and clean fuels is a sector that we need to tackle. The second thing is it's a positive market growth projection for this sector. Liquid fuels are expected to increase especially in the region in Latin America. I know for Europe it's different. It's actually quite the opposite trend. In Latin America, we'll see an increase in the utilization of liquid fuels. So up to 2030, 2040, we see projections of increase. The other thing about bioenergy is that it leads itself for inclusion for sustainability. It is a type of renewable energy that is capable to create direct and indirect jobs. So it's very important, even the Pope, when addressing Congress last week, mentioned that the objective of business is not just the creation of wealth, but also the dignity of a job for people. Fourth, it's a boost on circular and local economy. If we produce a fuel that is local, it goes into that microeconomy and it helps the people of that region. It also helps with circular economy. With advances in technologies, we see, for instance, if we talk about the biogas plant, you burn it to use renewable electricity. We're finding new ways, even though you're burning that unnatural gas cleanly, to even go the extra mile to use that CO2 to capture the CO2 and produce all sorts of other synthetic fuels, for example. And last but not least, I would encourage everybody to look into technologies again. I know first generation biofuels were looked at by many countries, many initiatives, and just some of them were, were successful. We're reaching a level of more promising technologies that deserve a second look. And with that, a call to action to finalize this webinar. If you go to this link I'm showing here in our website, latinoamericarenovable.com, there is a short survey, one minute survey, that you can fill out if you're interested in knowing more about bioenergy and the role it's going to play during the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. One second. Thank you again to our speakers for your excellent presentation. Now I will open the floor for questions. Um, and the first one I have here, it's what happens when for the U.S. and Latin American if the GOP get into office since they all deny climate change and are against CO2 reductions. I'm going to throw it to Dora. If she thinks someone else uh, should answer it, she'll indicate it. Okay, so if I understood your question correctly, what are we going to do if who is in office? I didn't get who is in office. Oh, the Republicans, the, the GOP. <laughs> okay, the Republican Party. Okay, I've been following some of the debates of these candidates. Um, I think at this point in time, both parties are looking into including renewables. Uh, of course, uh, you see from the Democratic Party, I guess have better push for renewables in the U.S. and they, they tend to lead the trend in the world. Uh, however, I have seen also some Republicans also looking into and talking about their energy strategy. 
Um, the fact of the matter is, it's geopolitical issues, and I think for Latin America, um, we have a bright future for renewable energy there. I don't know if anyone else wants wants to share something else. Uh, I can add something. This is Monica Raja. Um, I do think that in the last 10 years, we have been able to win a few debates. Uh, the first one is the scientific debate. Um, those who decided to, to declare that climate change is not real have lost. Um, you will always hear some noise, but they have lost the argument in the public debate, too. Uh, we, have, we are winning the debate on the economics of climate action. Um, and I think the third debate, where we are right now, is winning the hearts and minds. So regardless of who wins the election in the U.S., citizens, communities, mayors, companies, investors, academics are engaging in this because, not so much because of carbon of emissions or because technology is necessary, but because what people are worried about the impact of climate change what happens if you lose your hospital? What happens if an airport is flooded and you can't export? So there is a lot going on that is unstoppable. And I think it is very normal that people wonder what would happen if there is a change in, in the political leadership of any country. Of course, the US comes to mind, but it could happen in any country. But what we have seen that at the end of the day, um, on the ground, we see a scale of action um, that we had not seen 5, 10, 15 years ago. And that week, last week and this week in New York uh, have shown that this is growing. I don't know if you, if you, if the people in the webinar read the news today, but Shell, for example, is going to unplug uh, or put in, um, in a pause to their projects in, Ar in the Arctic. And I think that is a, a signal that something is going on in our society that will make a lot of this unstoppable. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for a second question, I have, based on your experience as pal panelists, do you think Mexico and maybe other countries are doing enough effort to reduce CO2 greenhouse gas emissions? Um, and I guess anyone can speak out if they want. Hello, this is uh, Deborah. Um, I think, well, Carbon uh, Climate Action Tracker has actually been trying to answer that same question based on the INDCs provided. And um, one of the graphs I provided show that, at least for the Mexico case, when they try to normalize the different contributions and, and see if yeah. collectively we can get to a two degree see um, increase in, in global and mean global temperature. Um, the tracker indicates Mexico as um, having a sufficient contribution, which means that there is still room to improve. Um, in my opinion, and based on the analysis of the different policies, um, both on the climate side and on the energy side, and then um, on the INDC, which also includes adaptation. I think the INDC responds to what the current existing policies can, can do. Um, as I also said, all those policies um, and, and strategies have a, have a deadline that will be updated. So hopefully in future revisions, um, Mexico will be able to, to go beyond that. But as of now, um, it is labeled as as a as a sufficient contribution based on its on its own on on its national um, circumstances. Okay, uh, this question is for Sylvia, and it's why did greenhouse gas reduction per capita go up again from 1.7 to 1.9 CO2e between 2030 to 2050? In Costa Let me see. Hmm. That's a good point. 
Well, Monica, do you have uh, this? This is the right number. Uh, that that's what I copied down. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Yes. No, Monica, um, just like you. asking you if this is a 1.9 ton CO2 equivalent per capita, is the right number? Because let me see if it maybe I copy wrong that number. No, it's it's, it's right. Uh, just just by the background, this is well, these are the numbers that came out last week in the draft INDP. So first, the first point is we have to wait until they have the final draft. If final draft, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that this, this question that the person asks is very important because it is precisely the question that came up in the presentation of the draft. Um, and the, the short answer, I'm sure Sylvia could add some background, um, the, the very short answer is that uh, we have here in San Jose a very intense debate around the role of forests and there are some, some disagreements uh, in terms of how much um, forests do in terms of carbon capture. So my point with this is that perhaps we need to wait until the final INDC is out, uh, hopefully this week before the 1st of October deadline, and um, we will have the final numbers. But as I said, much of the uncertainty is around the role of forest, and as Sylvia rightly pointed, there is no escaping from the interventions in the transportation sector. So the country will look very differently in 2030 and 2050 depending on whether we bet on, uh, for example, an, a big electric train or whether we continue uh, with our business as usual approach to transportation, which is uh, private cars, private cars, private cars. But I don't know if you want to add something. Well, no, like you said before, is the number presenting as a draft last week. So we need to wait the review from the political perspective to see the right number, exactly to see the strategy that Costa Rica is going to take to to get those goals and to to get to the right numbers. All right. Uh, so this question is for Dora. What are the negative side effects of bioethanol or biofuels in terms of agricultural capacity? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, when we look at effects in general, what we do as technical people is we go and do a life cycle assessment. Trying to answer that question without having a project allocation, where the uh, feedstock comes, where the, the, the fuel is going to be used, it's really not answering the question. But in general terms, I can say for the case of ethanol in Latin America, we usually do this term sugar payment for them. Emissions tend to be very positive in comparison with petrofuel. So in, it's a general answer. I would like to look into more specifics of the project, because we always look at negative effects again with land use, et cetera. We've had occasional Salvador. I am originally from El Salvador. We have El Nino affecting our crops. So the model we have there is we have a lot of vulnerable rural families cropping for beans and for um, corn. And we have some the in the in the in, in the places they're used to, um, um, it helps the crops um, it, it has different agriculture benefit. And after El Nino, some of these crops, the, the corn and the beans, they were destroyed. And the only thing standing was this drought-resistant weed called the sofa, where farmers could go and harvest and have some cash for buying food. So you can look at this in, in different perspectives and how climate change is affecting. There are so many factors that go into saying ethanol is good or ethanol is bad or biodiesel is good or biodiesel is bad. So I would encourage you to, to email. Uh, I have provided there a, a link and continue the conversation. Thank you, Dora. Okay, okay. so the next question I have is, aren't we losing 
Aren't we losing the battle against protective barriers that jeopardize the biofuel industry in Latin America? I'll give it back to Dora, but she might have someone else in mind. Well, if somebody wants to address it, I, I can open the floor. If not, I can go ahead. Okay. Can, can you repeat the question, please? It's, uh, aren't we losing the battle against protective barriers that jeopardize the biofuel industry in Latin America? Well, it, it is important to know that biofuels is not the only alternative fuel. We have many other options if it is a sustainable way to produce biofuels, it is important to take into consideration this alternative. And we have second generation biofuels that is made from, from agricultural forestry waste, so it is a, also a good alternative. Uh, maybe for many countries of Latin America it's expensive to search about or to implement second generation biofuels, but uh, I think it is continue working on this is is alternative fuel so I, I I don't see like a Latin America losing a battle about biofuels this alternative is have many other options like a biomethane from landfill and biogas I mean so I think it's just continue researching and developing those fuel alternatives Right. I would just like to follow up on Sylvia's answer. She's right about when she talks about second generation biofuels, those would, wouldn't be destroying a naturally protected area, rather they are used for waste products of the agricultural system. So you're already producing pineapple. Okay, you have pineapple scraps, you can use pineapple scraps to create that biofuel. But you have to look at this in a face-to-face -face basis. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question for Sylvia, and it's the change between 2014 and 2015 in the chart presented is dramatic. How did, I believe it's Costa Rica, accomplish the change within one year? Do you mean for electricity generation, or you mean for... Mm. Uh, the question just... Graph. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Well, maybe for, for electric, electric energy mix, you mean like a thermal, uh, the electricity from fossil fuels in 2014 was 10% in 2015 until now, of course, because we are in 2015, it's just 1%. It's because all the weather conditions, all the infrastructure that Costa Rica have for renewable energy production, so the difference is because exactly what they happen when we need to have a good and solid infrastructure for renewable energies because if the weather, because Costa Rica base is electric energy mix based on hydropower, so depends of weather, depends on different variables. Uh, this was a, was a good result, this is why. Um, the point is continue to be prepared and continue to invest in, an, in other technologies, renewable technologies, to continue to have this good performance in electricity generation. But I don't know if he's talking about this graph, actually. I, maybe he'll write in, but thank you. Okay, so this is going to be our last question. Um, it's for Monica, and it's Will INDCs be part of the Paris Agreement or in a separate annex? Uh, Monica, I think you might have to unmute yourself. Monica, are you there? Okay. I think we'll go to another question then. 
Can you hear uh, me? Ah, there she is. Okay. I think I've been unmuted now. Um, the, the question is, can you hear me? Yes. Can you You're hear back. me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, we were having trouble with Monica, so we'll go to another question. Um, and it's, don't we need a regional agreement on greenhouse gas targets? Is this possible in Latin America's present political situation? I will leave it to all of the panelists. Hello, this is Deborah. Um, at least in the, in the Central American region, there have been different efforts. There is um, a regional energy there is regional energy integration within the region from Mexico to, to Panama, and there is a goal of increasing the renewable energy use at a national level um, and at a, at a regional level. This is to decrease the dependency on fossil fuels. So if we look at the emissions reductions that are expected from this energy integration, I, could, um, I think we could say that, yes, there, there is an expected um, overall reduction at least if looking solely at the at the energy at the energy sector but also Central America through the um, Central America integration system has also been looking at disaster risk reduction and <clears throat> hello yes they've can you hear me yes I can hear you oh, okay so that the region has also been looking at energy integration um, and disaster, disaster risk reduction as, as, regional, as regional topics as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have available for questions. But I would like to remind everyone that if they have a question which was, which was not answered during the session, you will be able to connect with all of the panelists through the IRENA community at IRENA slash community, IRENA.org slash community. Here you will find the discussion forum for this webinar under featured topics. Before we conclude today, we would like to ask that you answer a very short survey about today's webinar in order to help us improve our webinar series. You will see three questions pop up on your screen and you will simply need to select your choice. Thank you very much for your feedback. Lastly, I would like to invite you to connect with Irina on social media. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. And that's it. Thank you very much and have a great day.